I'm going to talk about three things today. Uh, the first thing is that the internet is broken. Uh, the second thing is that we can fix it. And the third thing is that that's not a foregone conclusion. But of course, before I talk about those three things, I'm going to talk about thing zero, which is that the internet is important. The internet is a single wire that delivers free speech, a free press, access to education, to civic engagement, to political engagement, to better outcomes in health and nutrition, to uh, uh, higher incomes, and basically everything that we use to measure success in a society or a social program. And more than that, the internet also happens to be the nervous system of the 21st century, right? It's, it's the thing that wires together those general purpose computers that not only fill our pockets or our backpacks or sit on our desks, but that are also increasingly the nervous center of our houses. They're the nervous centers of our cars, of our airplanes. A 747 is a flying Sun Solaris workstation connected to a bunch of tragically badly secured SCADA controllers in a very nice aluminum case. So, that's, that's, uh, uh, so the internet is, is very important. Anything that connects all that stuff together is very important. But of course, thing one, the internet's broken. Now, if you had any doubt before June 6, 2013, surely all doubt has since been removed from your mind, because that was the day, nearly one year ago, the day when Edward Snowden came in from the cold and told us that spies from mostly the US and the UK had turned the internet, co-opted it into something for creating the world's most perfect surveillance state. A tool that knows everything you do, everyone you know, every secret you have, who all your friends are, everywhere you go, everything you think and everything you say. A horrific blend of Orwell's all-knowing secret of state, Huxley's entertainment-driven system of social control, and a bit of Franz Kafka's paranoid nightmare of a world where everything you do is subject to arbitrary interpretation, and you are expected at any moment to be able to uh, account for everything you've done or said against those, those uh, arbitrary interpretations, and where unaccountable algorithms pick results out of that giant surveillance system and finger them and single them out for inspection, for rendition, even for droning. As Glenn Greenwell writes in his absolutely excellent new book, No Place to Hide, initially, it's always the country's dissidents who are mar and marginalized who bear the brunt of surveillance, leaving those who support the government or are merely apathetic to believe that they are immune. And history shows us that the mere existence of a mass surveillance apparatus, regardless of how it is used, is in itself sufficient to stifle dissent. A, citiz a citizenry that is aware of always being watched quickly becomes a compliant and fearful citizenry. And if that wasn't enough, if state intervention wasn't enough, there's been all of the horrific breaches. For example, the current reigning Miss Teen USA, a woman named Cassidy Wolf. Uh, last year, had her computer hijacked by a sextortionist who took over her camera, used it to capture nude photos of her and her social media passwords, and told her that unless she performed live sex shows for him on that camera, that uh, he would post those nude photos to uh, her social media accounts. And then the US retailer, Target, they lost 110 million credit cards in just one breach. And then, just a month ago, there was Heartbleed. Heartbleed, a flaw in the internet's core security infrastructure that had been lurking there since 2011, exploited in the wild, but none of us knew about it. And when it came to light, security expert Bruce Schneier called it an 11 on a scale of 1 to 10 and said, look, just don't use the internet for a week until it's fixed. And when it comes back on again, change your passwords. And I hope you all change your passwords. However, thing two, all is not lost because we can fix the internet. So there's a cool thing. The internet wants us to have secrets. The maths underpinning modern cryptography, a science that began just a few miles down the road at Bletchley Park about 70 years ago, those maths are sound. We can use computers, the computers, the average computers that we have in our pockets, in our desks, that computer there counting down my remaining time, we can use those computers to, in tractable time, scramble messages so thoroughly that if you took every hydrogen atom in existence and turned it into a computer and set it to work, doing nothing between now and the heat death of the universe, trying to descramble that message, that you would run out of universe before your message was rendered into the clear without your permission. Edward Snowden, who is, after all, our only reliable source on the capabilities of intelligence agencies, Edward Snowden tells us that they can't break the maths. So all we need to do to fix the internet is something very hard. All we need to do is make security stuff easy to use. 
Uh, because right now, all the security stuff we have is optimized for the only people who gave a damn about technological security. And those were people who were already technologically sophisticated enough to grasp how important this stuff could be. And so, of course, nobody has ever simplified this stuff for use by normal people. So we have to figure out how to simplify this stuff for normal people, and then we have to figure out how to convince them to use it. Now, both of those problems are going to require smart people expending a lot of energy and resources to solve them, but we know how to solve them, right? We know usability is hard, but we know where usability is. We know what the path to it looks like. We know who we need to give resources and money to in order to convince people to use something that, after all, is very good for them. So that's good news, but thing three, none of this is a foregone conclusion. So let's talk about security for a minute. There's only one experimental methodology for validating security, and that's disclosure. I mean, any idiot can design a security system that works so well that he himself can't think of a way of breaking it. But all you've proved is that you've designed a security system that works on people who are stupider than you. Until you tell people how your security system works, until you let them poke holes in it mercilessly, you will have no idea whether or not you're kidding yourself. Prior to the Enlightenment, we didn't really have scientists. We had alchemists. And alchemists did stuff that looks a lot like science with one major important difference. Alchemists didn't tell people what they'd learned. And so every alchemist discovered for himself in the hardest way possible that drinking mercury was a very bad idea. And alchemy stalled out for 500 years. We call that period the Dark Ages. And then alchemists started publishing. They started telling people what they learned for a purpose of adversarial and often cruel peer review and replication. We call that the Enlightenment. Like all post-Enlightenment enlightenment disciplines, security only works when we can hone it through that adversarial process. In particular, unless we can tell people when there are flaws in the computers that they rely on, they will not know if those computers can attack them in every single way imaginable. So we can't do any of that step two, fix the internet stuff, unless we can talk about places where security is busted. But it keeps on getting harder to do that. All over the world, governments have spent the last 15 odd years passing laws, making it illegal to break digital logs. So it's against the law to jailbreak your iPhone. It's against the law to watch a Region 3 DVD on your Region 2 player. It's against the law to play homebrew games on your Nintendo DS. And it's against the law to make your own tool so that you can save your iPlayer programs for more than seven days. And it's against the law to give people information that they might use to accomplish any of those goals. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time here arguing about what the correct ethics are of watching telly or playing Angry Birds, because honestly, that stuff is just a sideshow. Unless you're one of the infinitesimal fraction of people, people like me, admittedly, for whom copyright represents a substantial part of your income, that stuff is about as relevant to the average person as debating the fate of lottery winners or lightning strike victims, depending on what your view of a career in the arts happens to be. So I want to focus instead on the network, on the nervous system of our 21st century, the thing that touches everybody in the world, not just copyrights, few lottery winners. So let's talk about what's happening to the network. It turns out that if you want to jailbreak an iPhone, or if you want to save an iPlayer program for more than a week, the way you start is by leveraging a flaw in one of those systems. You find a bug, and you use it to crack the system open, which means that if you want to ban breaking digital locks, you have to ban telling people about bugs in digital locks. And let me say that again, because it's the most important thing I'm going to say here today. If you want to stop people from breaking a digital lock, you won't be able to do it unless you criminalize telling people about flaws in digital locks. And we are about to get a monstrous whack more digital locks, because there's an organization, a, a really wonderful organization, called the World Wide Web Consortium that was founded by Tim Berners-Lee, one of the inventors, or the inventor of the web. And the World Wide Web Consortium, or W3C, they have um, spent the last 20 years making open standards for the web, the things that guarantee that anyone can participate in the web. But at Tim Berners-Lee's direction, the W3C has decided to add digital locks to HTML5, the next version of the web's standard. And they did it because Hollywood, Netflix, and the BBC went to them, and they told them that they would boycott the web unless the web was broken to their specification to ensure that people only watch telly in the right and prescribed way. Now, because of this, all browsers, even the free and open ones like Firefox, are closing themselves off and adding closed source illegal to disclose vulnerabilities and digital locks to them. 
And there's a long queue of industries at the W3C right now behind the video people who want to standardize digital locks for their products, like the ebook people who've asked that digital locks be standardized next for formatted text, basically web pages. Meanwhile, HTML5 is meant to replace apps as the primary way that we control everything from TVs to thermostats to phones, which means that every single computer from your car to your artificial leg is going to become a reservoir of long-lived vulnerabilities that you aren't allowed to know about and that spies, crooks, creeps, perverts, and voyeurs can use to exploit and take over your computer and attack you in nightmarish ways that make dystopian science fiction look tame and unimaginative by comparison. And I speak here as a professional dystopian science fiction writer. <laughs> and this stuff is only going to get worse because a digital lock does not take away your computer's ability to do some forbidden thing. An iPhone is not a computer that is incapable of running apps that don't come from the App Store. An iPhone is a computer designed to thwart you when you try to run such a program. It's a computer that assumes that you, its owner, whose most intimate secrets it's privy to, that you are its enemy and can't know what it's doing, can't know what processes are running on it, can't know what files are running on it, and can't control them. It is a computer designed to say, I can't let you do that, Dave. <laughs> we know how that works out. Because we only know how to make one kind of computer, one computer architecture, named for Bletchley's Alan Turing, the Turing Complete Computer, and that is a computer that can run all programs that we can express in symbolic logic. One thing we especially don't know how to make is a computer that can run every program except for the one that upsets you. But when the entertainment industry talks about making a computer that can't infringe copyright, or regulators talk about 3D printers that can't infringe patents or trademarks or print out guns or whatever's on the front page of the Daily Mail today, or in a few years when we start hearing about self-driving cars designed and locked so that boy racers can't make asses of themselves and endanger us all with drag races down the street, what we'll really be talking about is making computers that are designed to lie to and betray their owners. For so long as the idea of breaking computers to solve problems, no matter whether those problems are real or imaginary, no matter whether those problems are serious or trivial, for so long as that idea has currency and legitimacy, we are in trouble because there will be legitimacy in the proposition of designing computers to betray their owners, computers whose internal workings are forbidden knowledge for the people who depend on them. Those will be computers whose security flaws can't be disclosed, lest those flaws pave the way to allowing us untrustworthy owners to tell our computers what to do. And this is a disaster of epic proportions. In a world made of networks, there is never a legitimate reason to ask a computer to betray its owner. That is something that makes the current post-Snowden state of the internet seem positively utopian by comparison. There is never a legitimate reason to stop people from knowing how their computers work, or especially all the ways in which they're broken. Now, there are groups out there that fight to do something about this, groups I used to work for, even a group I helped found. Here in the UK, there's a group called the Open Rights Group. Internationally, there are groups like the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the Free Software Foundation, and those groups do nothing but full-time try to ensure that the liberties that we've depended on in the real world follow us into the digital world, and that as the real world and the digital world merge, that wherever a liberty is challenged, that it isn't the liberty that gives way. So you can go and do something about this. EFF.org for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. FSF.org for the Free Software Foundation. OpenRightsGroup.org for the Open Rights Group. All three of those organizations deserve and need your support. Please help us to keep the network free and open for our children. Because as much as I want to go on earning my living, telling you amusing stories that help you pass the long hours between the cradle and the grave, I am way more interested in making sure that my daughter doesn't enter a world in which the computers around her, the computers that make up the fabric of reality, are designed to betray her. Thank you.